it's a positive step. It's not the end game by any stretch of the imagination, but it is nice to see a government agency that listens and is willing to make adjustments for the betterment of the whole. That's Erica Stark from the National Hemp Association talking about the recent hemp news coming out of the USDA. This is the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast, and my name is Eric Herlock. So maybe by now you've heard about the USDA's decision to delay enforcement on certain requirements. They are delaying the requirement that all testing labs be registered with the DEA, and they are delaying enforcement of the requirement that hemp producers use a DEA-registered reverse distributor or law enforcement to dispose of non-compliant crops. So I thought I'd check in with Erica Stark from the National Hemp Association and uh, find out what the deal is. All right, we'll take a quick sponsor break and then get right into it. This episode is sponsored by Advanced Hemp, the world's first hemp-specific fertilizing system designed to maximize yields and CBD production. At Advanced Hemp, They have a team of 25 PhD plant scientists who have been researching the plant for over 20 years and they really know their stuff. So if you want heavy yields of high CBD hemp, feed your crops advanced hemp. But don't wait. Production is limited, so pre-order now at advancedhemp.com. This episode is brought to you in part by King's AgriSeeds, your source for premium forage, cover crop, and now industrial hemp seeds. King's is excited to offer Auto CBD, an auto flower variety that comes to full maturity in 75 days, allowing for early harvest and succession planting. Avoid the harvest and process bottlenecks by adding Auto CBD to your lineup. Call 717-687-6224 or go to kingsagriseeds.com slash hemp for more information. Erica Stark, welcome back to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. So what do you make of the USDA's recent reversal of the the DEA-approved labs and those additional destruction methods? Well, it's hard to look at it as anything but a positive thing. Certainly, it doesn't go far enough to alleviate all of the concerns that we have for the 2020 growing season, but it does show that the USDA is listening Mm -hmm. and that they are realizing some of the uh, unintended consequences of what they've proposed and that they are willing to to make changes. Mm -hmm. So certainly, mandating DEA certified labs would have been disastrous. I knew there were less than a hundred. I think the re- the number that they reported in their document was 47. Um, so yes, 47 labs across the country is certainly not going to be able to handle um, all these requirements. Right. And also leaving the disposal methods. Um, they specifically don't like us to use the word destruction. Um, they, they prefer disposal. Um, but giving the states the leeway to continue handling that the way they have been over the last several years is, is also a welcome change. So we're committed to continuing to fight for other changes, specifically in how the samples are taken, um, to not being just the, the tops of the flowers, but also you know to be a whole plant composite, mm-hmm. more representative of the biomass that is actually being sold. So um, in short, it's a good thing. It's, it's a positive step. It's not the end game by any stretch of the imagination, but it is nice to see a government agency that listens and is willing to make adjustments for the betterment of the whole. Hmm. Um, what's not clear to me at this point is how Pennsylvania is going to react to this change. Certainly the program that they've implemented for 2020 reflects uh, the need to use DEA certified labs and the DEA, you know, the USDA um, disposal methods. So I'm still waiting to hear back from them about are they going to make changes to the Pennsylvania program for this season to reflect the changes that USDA has made. I have not gotten a response from them on that question yet. Have Have you happened to? Hear? No, I have not heard from them. Okay. Um, so hopefully we'll get an answer from them and that they will make changes to the 2020 program to reflect the USDA changes, which would definitely be beneficial to Pennsylvania. Right. Um, I talked to the owner of a testing lab last week after the, um, the USDA news came out and he 
he was a little disappointed. I think he was looking forward to sort of the the DEA regulation and getting all of the labs sort of at a certain level? Well, I certainly wouldn't discourage any lab from pursuing getting their DEA certification. This is just a delay in the implementation, and I'm not seeing any indication that this is going to be a permanent change. So I think it's just to give the the labs enough time to get their DEA certifications uh, so there won't be these types of bottlenecks, because I agree that we do want consistency in the labs and that is an important aspect of it, but there just logistically was not enough time to get it done for, for 2020 season. Right. Um, so a few states are deciding to stick with the 2014 farm bill rules. What do you make of, of that? Well, it's more than a few. I, I think we might be close to 14 states that are opting to continue under the 2014 pilot program. And if, if nothing else, it sends a message to USDA highlighting the problems in the, the interim final rule that so many states have opted to continue under the 2014 pilot program. Um, personally, I have mixed feelings about it. Uh, the one thing I was looking forward to with the whole federal program and um, national program is that we would have a, a level playing field in that what's legal in one state is legal in another state and that everybody is sort of operating under the same rules. Um, That's not going to happen for 2020 in particular for those states that have opted to continue under the 2014 pilot program. But certainly I'm supportive of the states that that are doing it, not only to protect their industry within their state, but also by giving, um, giving the opportunity for, to fully realize the changes that they need to make to make this a workable program. Right. Do you think it puts states that are going, you know, with the new rules at a, like a disadvantage in the marketplace? You can make that argument both ways. I think in some ways it, it, it is a a disadvantage as far as being, if you're in a state like say Pennsylvania, that's not going to be quite as forgiving with the the THC level tolerances um, versus another state that's opting to continue with a program that does allow for, for more variants. But on the other hand, it is moving forward going to likely be pretty close to to what we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. So, Particularly for new states going online for the first time for this year under the federal program and also for the tribes, it will give them an opportunity to start out with the strictest compliance regulations that there's likely to be. And certainly nobody's ever upset when things are relaxed. So um, it's sort of a mixed bag in that regard. There's, There's pros and cons to both sides. The other problem I I potentially see is some of the nuance when it comes to the protection of transporting hemp across state lines certainly came with the passage of the 2018 Farm Bill. So technically, if you're still operating under 2014, you you may or may not be protected by those provisions. Uh, Certainly, states like Idaho using that as their excuse to to not allow it because they weren't being operated under the federal program. Um, And also with the, you know, some of the technicalities of the 2014 program was supposed to be for research purposes and not full commercial activity. Uh, How are banks going to respond to the states that are continuing to operate under the 2014 program? So just like everything else in this industry, it's complicated and it's, it's, and we, we sort of just have to see how these different pieces react as we go and, and find the best way forward. All right. Um, last week, I got an email from a listener who sent me the story about the, the Westmoreland County Company called Commonwealth Alternative Medicinal Options, which is shutting down its CBD processing facility. And she specifically requested your perspective on this. And she wants to know, how do we raise reality red flags without being all, the sky is falling? What do you make of that? Yeah, well, it's an interesting uh, question. And and certainly, Camo is not the only company that I've seen nationwide 
um, going through several of these these issues. Um, I've, I've seen processors go out of the industry almost at an alarming rate over the last you know six months or so, yeah. and it's. I think it's likely going to continue to happen. There's going to be people that got overextended and leave the marketplace, as well as there's new people coming in. And we're also going to see mergers and acquisitions of companies sort of joining forces. And it, it's, it is important to, to have that kind of reality check uh, for everybody in this industry, um, particularly to protect farmers. Uh, it's more important than ever now for farmers to really do their due diligence on any contracts they may be offered. Hmm. Certainly, when it comes to the federal crop insurance program, you're actually required to have a contract. So that concerns me a little bit that, that farmers may be enticed to sign a contract that's not in their best interest for the sake of having a contract and being eligible for that crop hmm. insurance. Right. So I, I won't say the sky is falling because it's not, but it's definitely concerning because it's not just some of the, you know, kind of smaller fly by night companies that we've known have been entering this industry for the last couple of years. We're also seeing established companies that were widely respected and, and considered to be uh, top players in this field uh, suffering. And um, slow and steady is, has been my advice from the beginning, and it continues to be my advice now. We are only just beginning to build this industry, and there are going to be growing pains sure. um, on the regulatory front, on the cultivation front, on the, on the, the business side. And um, it's more important to get accurate information now more than ever and to do due diligence on, on anybody that you intend to do business with. Do you think there's going to be fewer permits here in Pennsylvania this year? Yeah, that's one of those crystal ball type comments <laughs> get a lot, and I just simply don't know the answer to. I suspect that we are going to see a lot of people who grew last year uh, not grow this year, and I think we'll also see new people coming in that haven't grown before. Hmm. So whether that balances out. So my best guess is that we're going to be looking at relatively the same number of acres and permits as we had last year. Um, but of course, that is strictly a guess. So what other questions do you get for your non-existent crystal ball? <laughs> um, when there's going to be more widespread processing for, for fiber and grain, uh, when is the FDA going to figure out what they're doing about regulating CBD? Um, it's those, those, you know, like I, I get these emails all the time, you know, like I, I got an email the other day, somebody who's looking for hemp wood to, to make crates out of, and they, they don't understand why this isn't something like widely available. And it's like, well, there's nothing <laughs> widely available because there are no, commercial scale processors for fiber in the United States at this point. Um, so there are still major gaps in the supply chain that need to be addressed as we're continuing to work through all these regulatory issues. Um, and certainly as being Pennsylvania specific here, we have legislation that we absolutely must pass that primarily being SB 936, which will, remove hemp from the Controlled Substances Act, which right. is pretty basic, but pretty important. Yeah, it's um, such I'm a major sure. oversight on, on their part. Right. And the bill is very simplistic. It just removes hemp from the Pennsylvania Controlled Substances Act exactly the same way it was done on the federal level. Uh, so I'm not quite understanding why we're having trouble getting this to, to move. It, it feels like a no brainer to me. Um, the hemp legislation itself passed unanimously. There's, there's no reason this shouldn't move with, with lightning speed and be unanimous as well. Um, but the other important bill is SB 3, uh, 335, which will um, allow CBD specifically to be a dietary supplement and a food ingredient within Pennsylvania. Right. And because this, this delay with the FDA is, is happening, this bill doesn't seek to supersede um, FDA. 
it seeks to provide protection in this stopgap period while we're waiting for them to figure out how to regulate it. Um, getting back to the other bill that's trying to remove hemp from the controlled substances list, uh, is there like somebody in Harrisburg that listeners and farmers could just call up and start asking questions and try to you know move this from a constituent point of view? Um, certainly. This is a Senate bill, so anybody that's listening, yes, please contact your state senator and encourage them to get this passed. It's, uh, you know, legislators always tend to respond much better to their own constituents to to everybody else. So everybody's welcome to call all of them. Um, Particularly the one that represents you needs to hear from you about the, the importance of getting this bill passed. And what's the the Senate bill name again? The number? SB nine three six. SB nine three six. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, so I know that uh, through the National Hemp Association, you have been working in partnership with New Holland Ag. Can you talk a little bit about that work? Yes, it's been it's been really exciting. We had our kind of inaugural debut with them at the Pennsylvania Farm Show this year, mm-hmm. where we. A, a very large display. Um, they are very committed to this industry and providing solutions for equipment, which is one of the big bottlenecks that we have right now. Mm-hmm. So not only have they been developing specific kits that can be added to existing equipment to make it more conducive to hemp use, and you know, as far as protecting it from getting seized up by hemp's propensity to, to wind itself around the moving parts. Mm-hmm. Also looking to providing more specialized equipment for hemp production and also looking to help facilitate the bringing about of decortication machinery um, that will enable us to have a a true fiber industry in this country. Through our partnership with them, we are um, shifting our shows. Primarily, we had been working on doing cannabis shows and CBD shows and, you know, industry specific shows. And now we are shifting to do actual farm shows to provide farmers the, the more education it's, and it's been a very rewarding experience so far, particularly last year we did farm progress show for the first time. um, And it was a really rewarding experience and gives us the opportunity to reach actual farmers um, that are looking for this as a rotational crop and are particularly interested in the fiber and grain aspects and um, not quite so much as I, I feel like we've been kind of preaching to the choir with right. some of the other shows. If you're going to a, a hemp or cannabis show, you you already understand it, <laughs> at least for the most part. Yeah, and your, your message would sort of get lost in amongst all the other cannabis noise, but at a farm show, yeah, yep. And the other exciting thing that I can say about New Holland is that we are going to be planting 14 acres at their corporate campus this year. Nice. In New Holland. In New Holland. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Um, I just got the the final um, lease agreement signed with them. Um, So I'm ready to uh, finalize and submit our application to the Department of Ag for that grow. Uh, We're going to be doing four or five different fiber varietals. Um, and dual dual purpose crops. Um, and this will give them an opportunity to have a significant amount of acreage on site, which will you know help facilitate with their with their r and d right. and looking at how existing equipment can be modified and what new equipment um, they 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 want to propose moving forward. So I'm super excited about that. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I would like to come out and, and visit that maybe when they plant and when it's growing and because that's not too far from where we are. Well, we will definitely have you out there for sure. Awesome. Cool. So yeah, it's going to be the National Hemp Association that is um, permitted and in charge of, of doing it. Um, so yes, you know, you're you're welcome at any time. Oh, thanks. Um, so what other like news items or like areas of concern should farmers be thinking about, you know, now here, March, 2020? Well, I guess there's a couple, a couple of notable deadlines coming up. 
Um, the first being for anybody who is looking to participate in the federal crop insurance program for this year, the deadline to apply for that is March 13th. Oh, that's um, soon. Not a whole lot of time. Um, I do also understand that the, the program is less than ideal, but it's still um, important that as many people who can and are willing to participate in it do so, uh, so the program can be improved for mm -hmm. future um, again, that program does require that you have a contract, which I believe is going to be unfortunately prohibitive for a lot of people. Um, but just so you're aware that it is out there, um, the National Hemp Association is going to be hosting a webinar um, about all types of insurance options, and that's going to be on the 12th. Um, that particular podcast will be uh, open to the public. It's going to be March 12th at one o'clock. So if anybody would like to join us for that, they can go to uh, the National Hemp Association, nationalhempassociation.org. And on our homepage, there's a link to registration for that particular webinar. Okay. And I'll also put those links on LancasterFarming.com. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, and then we also uh, have the deadline to apply for cultivation permits this year is April 1st. So still several weeks for that, but... Um, that's right. earlier than last year, right? Uh, yes, it is. Now, my understanding is that's just for cultivation, that for processing permits, they will accept them throughout the year, but the, the deadline for cultivation permits is April 1st. Now, I will say there's a possibility, as in the past, that they may extend that if they're going to change the program for 2020 based off the USDA guidelines. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm hoping that we get some clarity um, from the Department of Ag on that shortly. Cool. Um, so that deadline's coming up. And so I guess for this year, the, the most important thing is to be mindful of compliance. Um, there still seems to be some misinformation out there about what decarboxylation testing is. Some people are still insisting to me that, that the Department of Ag has changed their testing methods, but they haven't. Um, it, it's just that now with the new USDA protocols and the way the 2020 program is, there is that 15 day window between when the compliance sample is taken and when harvest has to take place. Um, so that's something to be mindful of. And so selecting genetics this year is more important than ever, um, and it will be moving forward. So when you're looking at the genetics, you really need to look at total potential THC and not just delta-9, um, because the compliance testing, whether you use a DEA-certified lab or if Pennsylvania does allow us to use regular labs, it is total THC that matters. Um, and there still seems to be some confusion about that. Um, we're still seeing a lot of people who, who don't realize exactly how much the market for CBD has kind of dropped over the last six, eight months. Right. Um, whereas at the beginning of 2019, we were seeing pricing in the three, three fifty dollars per point per percentage of CBD and at the end of the season, we were looking at a dollar, sometimes even less than that. Right. So it still can be profitable, but it is not not the get rich quick scheme that that some people have been sold it to be. Right. And expect to see continued volatility in the market. So again, my advice to anybody is to go small and be ready to expand when the markets are able to expand with you. Um, as opposed to just, you know, diving in feet first and hoping for the best. All right. So you mentioned people doing their due diligence and learning about genetics and all that. And that kind of ties in with the PA Hemporium that the Pennsylvania Hemp Industry Council is hosting next week. Yes. And so I imagine you're heavily involved in that. What can you tell me about the PA Hemporium that's at Kutztown on March 13th? Yes, it's at uh, Kutztown University. And we have a full day of programming lined up with a whole bunch of fantastic experts, some of which you're probably already familiar with. 
Um, and I think the timing of this is, is going to be really good because not only are we, you know, two weeks before the final permits, we're, we're going to be able to catch people before they have to make a final decision on the genetics that they select or the number of acres they're going to grow. Mm -hmm. And also can, we have this new um, information from USDA and how that's going to impact things nationally. And we'll also have Sarah Pickle from the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. So at that time, if we don't hear sooner, um, she'll be able to give us the update of how the changes in the USDA program is going to affect our program here in Pennsylvania. Um, we're gonna have some really good segments on cultivation best practices for both fiber and grain. Uh, we're going to have representative from New Holland come talk to us about what they're working on and what they see for the future. Um, as far as equipment goes, um, we're going to have Josh Leidecker from Susquehanna Mills um, come talk about selecting genetics and making smart farming decisions. Mm -hmm. We're going to have Alyssa Collins from uh, Penn State come talk about what they've learned over the last three years of trials. Uh, Senator Judy Schwank will be our keynote. Um, of course, everybody stuck with me because, you know, <laughs> I can't not talk. <laughs> um, so I will be talking about uh, USDA regulations, Pennsylvania regulations, and um, what's going on now and what we project happening from the future on a federal level. Uh, we have Ross Duffield coming to, like I said, talk about the, the cultivation so I think I'm probably forgetting somebody. Well, you I... haven't you haven't mentioned anyone who hasn't been a guest on my show, so that's kind of cool. Well, because you, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we really tried. There's so many events happening out there. There's so much information online, and unfortunately, a lot of it's bad. Hmm. Um, you know. Not maybe so much intentionally, but there's just so much misinformation going on out there that we just really feel it's important to provide the best possible information and not just tell people what they want to hear, but the reality of what's happening in the real world. Um, you know, nobody supports this industry more than we do. Um, but in order for this industry to be successful, we have to be real and honest about it because it's the only way that we're going to long-term reach our goals. So can people just show up or do you have to register for the Hemporium beforehand? Um, you know, I, I actually don't know if there's on-site registration or not. I probably should know the answer to that, but to be safe, I would recommend um, ordering your tickets now. You can just go to pahemporium.com and register right there. And, um, I will find out whether there's on-site registration, but pre-registration is definitely the best bet. And there's actually a discount um, for registrations that are done this week. Oh, okay. But it's going to be a great event. Lunch is included. Mm. Um, there'll be ample time for us to give out a whole bunch of great information and for participants to be able to ask questions. Uh, and also most of us will be sticking around all day to, you know, have, have private conversations as well. Erica Stark from the National Hemp Association and the Pennsylvania Hemp Industry Council, thank you very much for your time. It's always uh, great to talk to you. I always love talking to you too. Thank you so much for having us. Well, all right, there you go. So you heard Erica talk about the event at Kutztown University on March 13th. Uh, maybe I'll see you up there. Uh, if you're going to the Hemp Crete Workshop in Kennett this weekend, maybe I'll see you there too. Okay, remember, you can always get in touch with me by email. You can send it to podcast at lancasterfarming.com. Heck, if you want to just call me up and leave me a message, you can do that too, 717-721-4462. My name is Eric Harlock. I am the digital editor at Lancaster Farming Newspaper, the greatest agricultural newspaper in the world. Don't take my word for it. Pick yourself up a copy or get a subscription at lancasterfarming.com slash podcast deal. Okay, until next time, I'll see you in the newspaper. Industrial hemp.
Episode 75 of the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast is copyright 2020 by Lancaster Farming Newspaper, part of the Steinman Communications family. Today's show was written and recorded, edited and produced by Eric Herlock. The music you hear throughout the show is courtesy of Tin Bird Shadow. <laughs>